Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Broadcast Solutions Innovation Days. Uh, next installment um, will be about SRT. Now, SRT is currently one of the sexy topics of video distribution. It's short for Secure Reliable Transport. Uh, essentially, we'll, we'll be told what it is and how it can help us by Mr. Sebastian Manneman from High Vision. Now, High Vision is a company that pretty much refined the open source idea behind SRT and made it into the almost standard protocol that it is today. So without further ado, over to you, Sebastian. Thank you, Peter. Um, hello, everyone. I'm going to share my uh, screen with you. So I hope that works. Um, yes. So. I'm going to be talking a bit about SRT today. Um, my role in High Vision is that I'm a sales engineer for the EMEA market uh, based out of Hamburg in Germany. Um, so a good joke is, uh, would every one of you please raise your hand uh, if, you, if you have ever been in touch with SRT yet? Um, unfortunately, I cannot see who raised his arm or who not. Um, so SRT is, as Viteri already mentioned, uh, short for Secure Reliable Transport, um, and is a transport protocol that High Vision initially invented uh, back in 2012 uh, to overcome challenges uh, with regards to live streaming. So back at the time we started thinking about SRT, and most of it is still valid, um, a lot of, of uh, project budgets uh, that we were bidding on with our encoding and decoding solutions were eaten by the sole uh, cost of transporting uh, video streams over uh, a given connection. Um, so basically there are like uh, three solutions that were out there and still are out there uh, available. One of which is uh, a satellite up and down link solution, which is obviously the most expensive, I assume. Um, also the most, um, uh, which is connected to the, to the biggest uh, effort you have to do to get your truck on site, to build everything up and to, to start your actual uh, transmission. Um, it's kind of difficult to schedule and it needs a lot of lead time uh, to be dealt with. Uh, most of these arguments also apply for private network top topologies. So whenever you, you are not a, a big company that owns an, a network and can use it um, as you wish, uh, you have to have a, a lead time to uh, to sign contracts, to get uh, provisioning. Um, most of the time you will need additional uh, hardware, which is meant to, to connect you to this proprietary network stuff. And most of the times, frankly, uh, contract terms are not reflecting the actual event that you are trying to stream. Um, and then there are proprietary solutions that might use the internet um, to stream, but most of the time you are bound to a specific vendor. There is only a handful of options you have. Um, there are also contract terms that get, go for an annual basis for, um, for SaaS solutions, for instance. And most of the time you would be priced per endpoint. Um, the other thing is when thinking about using the internet uh, or a unmanaged network, it's not, not necessarily the internet, is that you will have to overcome a lot of challenges um, to get a valid, good looking um, quality stream. Um, most of those challenges are, let's say, issues by design of unmanaged networks. So for instance, you would always have packet loss on the internet. It's not a question if packet loss occurs, but how much packet loss does occur on a given day. So even on an MPLS network, um, you will still have 0.01% or something network loss in average um, in a building. So if I stream from my basement up to my office, I already can see most of the time 0.1% uh, packet loss um, roughly. Um, if I stream across my company's campus, it, the number starts increasing. And if I stream over the internet on a good day, I might have 1%. On a bad day, I might end up with having 4 or 5%. It's also depending on the, the routing, on my ISP's uh, quality of service. There are a lot of, of factors that I, as a user of this line, 
do not have in hands and I cannot control this, um, these effects. Um, there are principles that, so the, the internet is a, a network of networks. It's not one big network. And therefore you will have different routing for in, in different moments in your stream, which can lead to delay or jitter. So um, jittering means that packets that are sent in a order will not necessarily arrive at the endpoint in exactly the same order. Um, the delay is just simply the time from sender to receiver that varies uh, re depending on how my routing is, is going to be handled. And the bandwidth is not always the same. So I can have a, band a, a good bandwidth connectivity from my house to the next uh, pop of my internet service provider, and then it can boil down to something else. It's just not something that we can control. All of these facts for a let's say regular TCP, I call a website and they send me a response. It is not an issue. If I, if I talk about video and um, I don't stuff my video stream with, with empty packets, um, I see immediate effects of all those things on my video stream because pictures will look blocky and, and will start to lose frames. Out. Um, so all of this, uh, we had in mind when we first started thinking about, okay, how can we overcome all of those issues and how can we make it easier to stream using unmanaged networks? And we came up with the concept of SRT. So what you see on the top left is actually a piece of paper uh, ripped off a wine bottle. Uh, and this was actually the first drawing of how SRT is supposed to work, which is framed in our CMO's office, uh, house uh, in, in Canada. Um, so SRT is intended to overcome all of the issues I mentioned earlier. Um, so to transport a stream from point A to point B using an unmanaged network, for example, the public internet, uh, in the lowest possible latency, but with the ability to recover all of the packets. Um, in addition to that, SRT can increase security by encrypting your stream. It is not encrypting your content, so it is not messing with your, with your stream. It is encrypting the connectivity between two endpoints. Uh, it can recover from packet loss using a mechanism called ARQ, advanced re-request. We will talk about this in a, in a few minutes. Uh, and it is aware of your link capabilities by sending empty packets or, or measurable packets. Uh, it can determine bandwidth and fluctuation in bandwidth. It can determine the packet loss that you suffer from uh, on the route to your endpoint. It can determine the latency of your stream and it can determine the jitter of your, of your connectivity. All of this is what SRT does um, under the hood, basically. So a little bit of history about SRT. Most of you might be aware that it is an open source protocol. Um, some of you might heard that High Vision is the initial inventor of SRT, which is in fact true. So back in 2012 on IBC uh, was the first time that we showcased SRT and with a very strong showcase actually, because we were streaming from outside of the RAI Convention Center to the inside to a meeting room in RAI using SRT. And whoever has been to IBC and messed with his mobile phone reception in Rye comes to the point that it is close to being impossible to stream something from outside to inside of Rye. We managed to do this on 2012 um, or 2013. And then we started productizing SRT in our products. So in our Makito X encoders and decoders, uh, we built the SRT gateway back in 2015. And then 2017, we were a bit on the glimpse between becoming one of those proprietary solutions that I mentioned earlier, or becoming or doing something different, making SRT open source and trying to push it to become a de facto standard in the broadcast industry. And that's what we did. Um, so we founded the SRT Alliance back in 2017. Um, we made SRT open source. And by saying open source, I really mean everything is being open sourced. Um, and from that on, SRT became kind of a success story. So starting with around 40 members in, in IBC 2017, which were like uh, people that we have been engaged with already before about SRT, so the, the likes of Wowza, VLC, and FFmpeg. Um, 
we pretty soon became 100 and plus members back to now where we are at 450 plus members. And there are not only small names in that, there are names like Microsoft and Sony. Uh, Panasonic just quite recently announced that they will uh, will have a, a, a SRT enabled camera on the market that can um, that can directly stream out SRT. Um, we have uh, um, Aspera, we have uh, Harmonic, Atem working with SRT. So not only companies that we uh, that we are good friends with, there are also some competitors using SRT. But the idea of making it a uh, industry standard was a success and and still is being much more successful um, in, the, in the near future. How does SRT work and how does it recover from, um, from issues that I described earlier? So basically the principle is kind of easy. Um, on both ends of the aisle, so on sending side and receiving side, we do have a buffer, sending buffer and receiving buffer. Uh, so the sending buffer obviously stores packets that are to be sent out or that has been sent out. Um, this buffer is being scaled according to the round trip time bet between both endpoints. Um, so if I have a round trip time of uh, 30 millisecond at the start of my stream, uh, the buffer will be scaled according to this round trip time to reflect the, the amount of packets that need to be resent. If my round trip time increases, the buffer will increase on the same level. Um, this sending buffer does control the actual latency. So if you look at SRT statistics, for instance, in your encoder and your sender, um, what you see there in the, as the sending buffer is effectively the latency of your connection. Um, on the other hand side, we have the receiving that buffer, which can be lower than the sending buffer. Um, that is um, because depending on the way how you decode and what device you use to decode, it will be quicker or slower in decoding and in emptying this receiving buffer. Um, so what happens now, if I send a series of packets to my endpoint, which is numbered on the left-hand side from one, one to nine, um, every packet that is being sent over SRT will get a unique identifying number and they are counting upwards in sequence. So that means my receiver is able to determine I received packet one and I received packet three. So packet two in a row is missing. It hasn't been arriving in time or in the right order. Um, and what the receiver will do in this moment, it will send a um, acknowledgement for every packet that arrived so that the sender would know, okay, I can, uh, I can delete this packet out of my sending buffer and make space for new packets. And it will send a non-acknowledgement flag uh, to the sender saying, I'm missing packet two and five and six, if you follow the graphics here. Uh, so the sender will know immediately, okay, I need to resend packet two, six and five in order to fulfill the sequence of packets that have been received by the uh, decoder. This uh, mechanism is called ARQ, so advanced pre request. Um, now, when I have to resend those packets, it obviously allocates additional bandwidth. Um, other than with, with other mechanisms that are out there, like forward error correction or something, um, this is this resending scheme is being done in a burst mode. That means I have a nominal bit rate, let's say 10 megabit, and I can define in my SRT settings how much bandwidth overhead I'm going to grant to this, um, to this route. Let's say the standard value is 25%, so my maximum bandwidth usage is 12.5 megabit. So what the sender now will do in this in the moment that packet loss occurs and that packets need to be resent, it will allocate enough space up to, to 2.5 megabit because that's the maximum I, I granted in my settings uh, to resend those packets. So having this option of, of uh, calculating or of limiting the bandwidth overhead and the option of setting the latency value while I set up my SRT route gives me enough space to play around with my settings in the in the case that I can um, that I can recover all of the packets that are lost uh, on flight. So that's the basic principle of how packet loss and jitter are being uh, are being overcome. Another thing that we figured out while creating SRT is that. When talking about using the internet for streaming, 
um, at least IT departments in the vast majority of our customers were like, are oh, you crazy? Um, so establishing outbound connectivity most of the time is not an issue, but establishing inbound connectivity from the internet over UDP uh, has been a headache or could be a headache for most of the IT departments that are out there. Um, so we, we invented SAT having a concept of callers and listeners. Uh, caller and listener does not reflect who sends or who receives the stream. Caller and listener only reflect who is going to initiate a connection and who is going to an accept a connection. That's what caller and listener are for. So having those two modes in place, I can use uh, unknown firewalls to stream even inside my, uh, my domain using SAT. So if I set up, uh, like in the second example here, a gateway, this is an example with one of our products that, that goes with every SAT product, basically. If I set up a listener in a neutral domain where I can control my, uh, my IT uh, specifics, um, I can call in from an encoder, send and stream to this domain, and then my decoder can also call in and receive exactly the same stream into his domain. And I didn't have to open any port whatsoever in any of both firewalls. Um, that's a huge advantage of SRT because it makes discussions with IT departments way easier and it eases the pain of IT administrators uh, all over the place. Um, so with SRT, you are able to solve three major pro problems that you might face when streaming over the internet uh, or when streaming your content. Uh, over which path whatsoever. Uh, first of which you can replace uh, proprietary cost intensive solutions uh, that are out there with the same level of experience with even lower latency compared to satellite or some, some other proprietary solutions. Um, and with a fraction of the cost and the fraction of the effort that you need to schedule uh, those events. Um, SRT is also replacing a lot of RTMP based workflows. Um, for instance, as we're having a, a close uh, relationship with Microsoft, uh, Microsoft is on the path to replace some of their streaming services uh, and switch from SRT ingest to uh, SRT based ingest. There are other companies out there that do the same uh, because it's just so much more reliable. Uh, than, than RTMP is, it utilizes the bandwidth way more efficient than, than, uh, than other protocols. And the latency compared to, especially compared to RTMP is, is uh, a no brainer basically. And SRT nowadays functions oftentimes as a kind of a glue part between cloud-based media processing workflows and uh, let's say baseband to IP encoding solutions. So we have a lot of partners around there that, um, that work as a cloud-based processing engine. One of those is Cortex, for instance. They run a OTT platform in the cloud and their only way to ingest into this, uh, into this uh, ecosystem is via SAT. Uh, for the same reasons, basically, as the, the RTMP replacement. So the latency is way, way less than, than with other solutions. The simplicity is great. Um, and they can recover packet loss, especially when you're at the beginning of your OTT or whatever processing chain, you want to have a clear input signal uh, to be processed. Um, some simple use cases about uh, SRT, most of them you, you might be aware of, but just to rephrase, there is a, a simple way of directly connecting an encoder to a decoder or to a, some kind of receiving device uh, using our Makito X encoders, for instance which goes perfectly over the public internet. You just need one public IP address on, on either aisle, uh, one open UDP port on one side and you're good to go. Um, and it's most of the time it is being set up in a matter of minutes only um, because it's SRT is literally plug and play. Um, another a bit more sophisticated use case and you can see the strengths of combining SRT with, with our products for instance is that you can multiply SRT streams using a gateway. So in this in this uh, remote contribution use case, you can see that there is a location where one or many encoders are being connected to a camera. They are streaming to 
uh, one of our products, which is a SRT gateway. And this gateway is multiplying a stream for different applications. So that means that you can uh, backhaul this to your production facility, give it to a decoder, make it baseband again, and use it for your production workflow. You can also uh, relay this to a broadcast center, which then would another gateway play this stream out into a uh, multicast or a RTMP stream or whatever is needed on this facility. And uh, on a third base, you can um, you can relay this stream to a mobile application for monitoring purposes or for uh, for referencing back to the remote location using one of our play uh, play apps or or setup boxes. Um, so that that is where SRT and and our products are kind of versatile and, and kind of um, strong in the meaning that uh, we try to utilize SRT as much as we can uh, within our product. And I think this is something that, yeah, just summarizes the feature set of our SRT gateway, which is at the core really um, leveraging everything SRT um, provides from statistics to the strength in, in flipping from one protocol to the other. Um, traversing firewalls and and replicating streams that is everything that we can or what we see we can do with SRT is being introduced into this product into this gateway um one interesting thing about SRT I'm not sure if I mentioned it at the very beginning is that uh SRT is completely content agnostic meaning that what you funnel in is what you funnel out um it is not um not taking codecs or audio channels or bandwidth or uh, progressive versus interlaced framework whatsoever. It is not even uh, checking what is in the transport stream that you give in. It is just wrapping something around it, transferring it, and playing out the same thing at the receiving side again. And that is it. I think I'm at the very end of my presentation. Is there anything you want to ask me? No. So um, this is Petteri. Uh, I'm looking at the the uh, event thing, and there are a few questions actually have come cool. up. So first one is, how is the adoption of SRT moving on? So what is the adoption currently among broadcasters and productions? Uh, I would say over the course of the yeah maybe last two years the adoption of SRT is picking up very very quickly um, reflecting on the market that I mostly work in which is the uh, Germany and Austrian market uh, we see a lot of movement in the direction of SRT uh, also replacing uh, existing network capacities um, Within broadcast domain, a lot of of SRT in the in the event based uh, contribution sites. Um, so I think it is picking up quite good, and it is in fact becoming kind of a standard. So another question is that related to how finished is the SRT protocol in terms of are there any new features novel features and functions that are coming in the near future or in the roadmap that uh, would give even more possibilities for, for its use? Yes. So in, in terms of how finished is, I would answer, we just got started. Um, so there are basically two, two tracks in SRT that are, I think are kind of interesting. So again, SRT is not something that we as High Vision develop only we do have uh, two developers that are working on the SRT alliance in full time now it's actually it's three developers that are full time working on SRT but there are many other contributors to the open source project as well so um, it is kind of hard to to estimate where all of these efforts are heading but i we we what we clearly can see in there is that SRT is going to inherit a in protocol layer redundancy pretty soon uh, which means that we will be, not we as High Vision, we as SRT uh, Alliance will be able to stream redundant uh, controlled by the protocol. So it's not an application layer redundancy that you have to implement very 
with, with high efforts, it is something that SRT will provide you with as a redundancy scheme. Um, that is really interesting and has been demanded by a lot of our customers at least. Um, and that is going to be there pretty soon, I guess. And it's going to be very interesting. The other thing is that with SRT, I mean, if either one of you went to GitHub and had a look at the SRT uh, source code, you may have mentioned, uh, may have, have seen that uh, there is a SRT live transmit, but there's also an SRT file transmit. That means SRT is not only capable of transmitting live streams in a very uh, secure way with very low latency, but SRT is also capable of transferring files in the same way. Uh, and that will introduce, that is at the very beginning of the development, this, the, the functionality is out there. There have been some, uh, some, some tests and some use cases where we tried it, um, but this is something that is going to be very interesting in the, let's say midterm, um, midterm view on SRT. It's going that we, that we are going to connect live and file-based workflows using the same protocol, which is very unique. All right. Thank you very much, Sebastian. You're it was very, a very, very nice welcome. presentation. And thank you. Thank you for the audience to the audience for for watching this. And uh, once again, thank you to everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. If you feel you, that you need to know more about SAP, feel free to reach out to me on the platform here and I'm, I'll be happy to answer. Thanks.